One of the things that blew up in North American society during the pandemic was the issue of racism and oppressive systems for people of color, minorities in our society, and for the marginalized. It might do well to think about this for a bit. Most white people do not think of themselves as prejudiced, but all of us are part of a society and a world that can be very hard on those who are not white and middle class. Black Lives Matter has become a plea not only to recognize individual prejudice, but also societal attitudes that most of us absorb without thought. And in Canada, I have often seen the way our First Nations or Indigenous sisters or brothers are treated in stores, hospitals, and on the street. A lot of these white attitudes are based upon fear. Fear of, quotes the drunken Indian. Fear of the black teenagers walking down the street. Fear of the foreigner. Fear of the unknown. And ironically, in my conversations with friends and acquaintances with darker skin or different ethnic backgrounds, they share similar fears of those who are different. Rather than lecture about this evil that is so embedded in Canadian, North American and European history and present structures, I would like to offer a relatively surefire method for facing attitudes of prejudice or racism. Get to know the people that you would not instinctively hang around with and you will learn a fundamental truth. Here are three examples. First, I recall visiting a lovely older white couple in a city in the United States where there had been tremendous racial tensions and conflict. This family had actually moved out of a dangerous neighborhood into the suburbs where they assumed everybody was white. The couple then told me how horrified they had been when they realized that a black family with three preteen children had moved in right beside them. Their initial response was anger at the realtor and then a knee-jerk reaction to move again. But then one morning, as the two wives were walking down their respective sidewalks to their cars, the black lady, we'll call her Diane, said, hello. And when the elderly lady, Marge, responded, Diane introduced herself. The two got talking and Marge was astonished to hear Diane say, how grateful she was to get out of the same dangerous neighborhood that Marge and her husband had left so that their children could get a decent education and be safe. Later, Marge talked with her own husband and they invited the entire family over for a meal, introducing the kids to some of the games and things that they had played with their own kids. They all became friends. Second, I was told this story by a woman who had been a refugee and was accepted eventually into Canada. We'll call her Grace. She talked about the parish community that had sponsored her and her family, how much help had been given, and how grateful they were to be in a country that was safe while offering so many opportunities. Then Grace added, and I paraphrase, but best of all were the people who befriended us. Yes, they were a big help with money and getting settled, but even better were the times they spent with us dealing with bureaucratic paperwork, helping us find education and jobs, sharing meals with us and explaining Canadian ways. And they were also open to learning from us. Grace went on to remember in particular one woman who had been helpful but had hardly said a personal word to any in the refugee family. Then Grace said, one day she came and hugged me and told me how hard it had been to be part of the helping team because she had always thought of migrants as parasites looking for an easy life. In watching and sharing with us, she had eventually come to understand an astonishing and wonderful conclusion. Migrants are just like us, wanting a normal, safe life. Then with tears in her eyes, she had thanked our whole family. My third story involves a family where the son revealed to his parents that he was gay. This was a stunning revelation and the father found it particularly hard to accept. Tension rose and continued in the house 
until the boy went away to university. But then came the crisis. About a year later, the son told his parents that he had found somebody that he wanted to have as a partner for life. The father, who had been hoping that this was all a bad dream and that his son would straighten out at first, at first refused to meet this potential partner. But the mother prevailed, and a very tense supper and evening was followed by the father reaching out to his son's friend and spending time with him to get to know him. And I remember the father's comment, which again I paraphrase. He's really a nice person, and I am happy for my son. I realize I would like things to be different, more normal, but there's nothing wrong with these young men, and I am sure that they will be able to live their lives more happily with my blessing than my anger. And I will admit, I am still learning. Now, do you see the surefire method for dealing with prejudice? Get to know the people you think you are afraid of. The fundamental truth is that they are just people like you and me. So now let us conclude by asking you to remember the parable of the Good Samaritan. It begins with the lawyer asking Jesus, and who is my neighbor? But the parable then ends with Jesus asking the lawyer, and to whom are you a neighbor? All of us, black, white, Asian, Aboriginal, gay, not gay, must learn to get to know the neighbor whom God puts in our path. As the father of the gay son in my last story says, this is about learning and growing in the face of our own prejudice and judgmental attitudes.